invite them, and uh, if, if you happen to invite somebody that's a little bit off, we'll, we'll be gracious, all right? So uh, keep them coming. It's a blessing. Revelation 13 in your Bibles, if you would, please. Revelation chapter number 13. Pick up where we left off last time. And uh, don't forget, we're looking here at the Antichrist. And I showed you how uh, Revelation chapter 13, this, this beast that shows up is different from the one in chapter 12, although they're similar. Uh, they got a real connection. They're closely connected, but you notice that they're different. This one's a leopard. And I showed you how a leopard is an integrated beast. It's a beast that has a yellow body to it with a white belly, and it's got black spots. And this particular beast has the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, and, and, uh, and he's got the, uh, yeah, the feet of the bear and the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gives him his power. So it's a leopard that's a really strangely, um, it's a genetic mutation. It's kind of weird. Uh, Lucifer himself, not to get too weird on you, but it's there. The Lucifer himself is a shapeshifter. Isn't that strange? How he appears different ways throughout your Bible. He appears as a serpent. He appears as a dragon. He appears as an angel of light. He's a shapeshifter. And the ultimate shape he likes to try to make himself out to is like Christ. He wants to imitate Jesus Christ. I've told you before, when it comes to the devil, and we'll look at some of this stuff tonight, when it comes to the devil, everybody gets this weird hang up about him being at the crack house. Well, I do believe the devil works through narcotics. Did you hear me? 100% do believe the devil works through narcotics. I 100% believe the devil works through alcohol. It's food and what? Spirits. That's a strange thing to call it, food and spirits. Uh, there's a different spirit about those places, and there's a different spirit about drugs. You better be super, super careful about experimenting with drugs. I heard some adults recently saying this about their kids. They're saying, we're fine with them experimenting with drugs as long as they do it while they're in our house so we can watch them. Yeah, yeah, 40, 30, 40-year-old 40 adults talking about their little kids. We're okay with our kids experimenting with drugs. You lost your mind. You got no idea nowadays what you're even getting. You know how much of this, the fentanyl they're putting in that stuff? Enough to kill you. It scares me even being in some of those neighborhoods because you could just come and brush in contact with this stuff and get enough to kill you. That's scary, man. Uh, the devil definitely works in narcotics. The devil definitely works through uh, fornication and adultery. Ways of becoming demon-possessed is, is sexual sins and alcohol sins and drug sins. That's a way to become demon-possessed. Now, relax for a minute. I never said you're demon-possessed if you've had those problems in the past. Did you hear me? Don't, don't get hung up on that stuff, man. People get weirded out by all that. Let me ask you a question. Have you asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you? Yes. Did He forgive you? Yes. Okay, so then He washed you in His blood, right? Yes. You're worried about a demonic spirit having more power than the blood of Jesus Christ? I'm not. I don't care what's in your past. If you've given your heart, mind, and soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, then leave it in the past and don't mess with it. What I'm telling you is for these kids, especially, these young people especially, when you live in a day and age where you're encouraged to go do anything you want and be anything you want, you feel like a girl, okay, you're a girl. No, you're not. There is no such thing as transgender. It does not exist. You understand that? That's a demonic influence of shape-shifting. Trying to take you from what you are that God made you to becoming something you're not. I don't care how much mutilization surgeries you have. You are what you are. God made male and female, and that's it. That's all that exists. You understand? It's all that exists. It's a crime against humanity to encourage the rest of that stuff. And it's a sin against children. They should lock up the doctors and the school teachers and put them in jail when they teach that stuff. You're messing up them kids psychologically, and you're giving yourself to something demonic that's not of God. Now, I won't apologize for it. And if I wind up in jail for it, then I wind up in jail for it. And they come interview me, and I'll just get it in, in the interview too. You know what I mean? I don't care. That stuff is wrong, and it's ruining lives. Now, what you never heard me say is that I hate transgender, did you? If you heard that, it's because you got a hard heart, you're rebellious, and you're wicked as the devil himself. I never said that. 
You never said I hate people that got a drug problem. I've probably talked to and tried to help and prayed with and answered the phone with and gone through more of, of trying to assist people like that than, than most people, uh, more than you realize, okay? I never said I hate them. I never said I hate a homosexual. Never said that. I said I hate the sin. And I never said I hate a whole Roman Catholic. Because we started talking about that last week and we're going to talk about it some more. I don't hate them. I told you, it's my bloodline, man. My grandparents on both sides were Roman Catholics going way back. I don't hate them. I know some really good, fine, upstanding Roman Catholic people, good people. You know what I do hate? I hate the doctrine. Because the doctrine's not of God, but it's got an unbelievably strange grip on intelligent people. I don't understand people sometimes. I don't get it, man. I don't get it. I heard a preacher, an older preacher, talking about how he was at the gym and he was witnessing to some 22-year-old kid at the gym. And the kid said to him, uh, well, I don't know you're a preacher, right? He said, yeah, I'm a preacher. He said, well, I don't get you preachers. You're all using the Bible to back up what you say. And one says I got to be baptized to get saved. And one says I don't. And one says I should speak in tongues if I got the Holy Ghost. And one says I'm not supposed to. And if I do, I got the wrong spirit. And one says this. And one, he said, I don't get you preachers. And he said, how old are you? He said, I'm 22. He said, you got a college education? He said, yeah, I do. He you know what the preacher said to him? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Yeah. What kind of way is that to witness? A great way if you're talking to a 22-year-old man, you know, like a man, talking to a man like a man when you're old enough to be his dad, that's a great way to talk to him. He said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. He said, why? What do you mean? He said, you mean you're 22 years old, you got a college education, and you can't tell when somebody's lying to you? What's wrong with you? Ain't that a good point? <laughs> I don't understand some people. I don't get it, man. I don't know why they drink the Kool-Aid. I just don't understand it. How do you go to church and have them never open a Bible and shut the lights off on you so you can't open your Bible and sit there and think you're in church? I don't get it. How do you go there and sing songs like I talked about this morning written by an open homosexual and sing those in churches all over this country to rock music? They put a rock music beat to it and you get up there and you got a bunch of girls on the platform dancing. Do you hear me? You, you guys okay with your wife getting up there dancing on the platform? No, sir. I'm not accusing everybody of being a pervert. Ladies, not all men are perverts, okay? But guess what? We're all human. And no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. So I'm not stupid either. Something is wrong, folks. It's a bad spirit. And I'm telling you tonight where the devil really works more than the crack house, more than the whore house. I did tell you how bad that stuff is, right? I did tell you that those are some major inroads for the devil. I did tell you those are places for addiction and corruption and destruction, right? I'm telling you more than the crack house and more than the whore house where the devil really works is in church. And that's what scares us. That's what we'll look at tonight. So what he is, is he's integrated. And you see it, if you look down at verse number 7, it says, When it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. You see that? Now, I reminded you last time what God did when he split them up. When they all got together in a one world deal, they set one goal together. What was their goal? Build a tower to get to God. There was an obsession with outer space. What are you guys seeing in the day and age you live in? An obsession with outer space. Why? I'll tell you why. It's a demonic spirit. Where's Lucifer at? He's up and down. He's in the deep. He's in outer space. He's a ruler of the darkness of this world. and He's got principalities and powers. He's moving out there up, up and down, going back and forth. He's moving around out there. Yeah, there's something out there. They're wanting to make contact with stuff out there. Well, who, which one of you was it? It might have been Brother Richardson. I'm not sure. Which one of you was it that said something to me about the, some Catholic priest, or was it, it was a Catholic priest, I think, that said that if the aliens come, he's going to baptize them into the Catholic Church because they're already, was that you? And I, I heard it from somebody else, too, so it's more than one source. He said he's going to baptize them into the Catholic Church because they're good. They don't need to go through catechism and all that since they're eternal beings they're already in. What? You're all laughing. Why are you laughing? You're laughing because it's insane, but do, don't you realize that was mainstream news? 
Don't you know that's all over Fox News and CNN News? It's common, it's common communication now? It's nuts. You know what blows my mind? I was a little boy 40 years ago sitting listening to one preacher that I knew of who was studying the Bible and didn't have all the information that you and I have today. And from studying the Bible and going through Revelation and going through Daniel and just letting the Scriptures explain the Scriptures, he was prophesying that this stuff was going to happen. If he was still alive today, he'd say, I told you, man, I told you, yeah, I know it, I know it, oh, but whatever, you know, pass them, pass them, you know, biscuits and gravy. It'd be like no big deal to him. Yeah, I know, I know it was coming. Isn't that wild? That's the day and age you're living in. There's an obsession with getting out there. And there's an obsession with making us all one. Yeah. We're all one. No, we're not. And we're all equals. Excuse me, I know this is going to offend some people. I promise you, please hear me. I promise you, I'm not trying to be offensive. I don't like it when people don't like the church. I don't like it when people leave and don't like me. Somebody told me this morning, we really like it here. We really like you. I said, well, praise the Lord. I mean, it really was a blessing to me because I'm like, good. <laughs> got to gotta win one once in a while. You know what I mean? The preacher say, how many are you running? Oh, we're running a bunch. They're just running them off. Hundreds and hundreds of them are running. You know, like, I mean, you know, I don't like that. I want to reach people. But we're not all equals. Lucifer said, I shall be like the Son of God. His issue was an authority problem. He didn't like having anybody over him. It's an authority problem. It's a demonic spirit. The church today, the church, not a specific church, the church in general today has a demonic spirit about it. Yeah. Don't give me that authority. Don't give us that authority. Well, the Bible's outdated. You know how many Christian people will sit there and say the Bible's outdated? The Bible's not relevant. Well, that doesn't apply because the Bible's offensive. I mean, the Bible really offends you and it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. <laughs> like, excuse me, how dare him say that? I didn't say that. You think I said that? You think I'm stupid? You think I said that? I live in an all-girl environment except me. Even the dog's a girl. You understand that? I mean, you don't know how used to pink and purple I am. Nothing about me is a pink or purple guy. But all the time, if I got to grab a blanket or something, whatever, it's a blanket. You know what I mean? It's like, don't tell nobody I said that. Don't make fun of me for it. I'll shoot you. If you're male, I'll shoot you. If you're not lady, I'll just let it go. But now, you know what I'm saying? I'm an all-girl environment. You know, let me, let me tell you more than that. Listen, I hate it when guys act like women are, you know, beneath them. I don't like that. I don't think you're a leader at all if you've got to be like, I'm the head of the I'm just shut up, woman, do what you're told. You're a coward, man. I joke about it all the time. Me walking around my house saying I'm the man is like me walking around here saying I'm the pastor. You'd be like, what? Okay, bro, chill out, right? That ain't, that ain't leadership. I don't like that stuff. I didn't say that. I wouldn't say it. You know why? I'm a sinful man, and I know that. You know how hard it is for a woman to submit to a sinful man? Especially since most of you ladies are smarter than your husbands are. Sorry, guys. I'm not trying to put you down. Don't hate me. <laughs> I'm trying to survive this. You understand? Okay? It really. I mean, it just seems like women are a little more thoughtful sometimes and a little deeper than men. It's still God's structure. Every other structure you, that the world dreams up doesn't work out. It just doesn't work out. Women are more and more miserable all the time, and so are kids. Why? Authority's the problem. You know what the Lucifer's trying to do? He's trying to break every boundary God gives. When God says, I want them busted up, so I'm going to spread them out, and I'm going to give them different languages, Lucifer says, bring them together. Bring them together. Bring them together. We're all one. We're all one. Bring them together. Oh, don't be divisive. Oh, don't, but the Bible's divisive. Oh, don't be divisive. Why can't you just accept people? Why can't you accept me? Why do I have to accept you and you can treat me like garbage because you know I don't agree with what you believe? I can disagree with what you believe. I can disagree with how you live. I can disagree with everything about you and as a Christian still be kind to you and pray for you. And I'm the first number you call when your car breaks down or you're stuck at the side of the road or you need something and be there to help you out. They won't do that for you. They're lying. It's a, it's a false spirit. It's a spirit to shut you up and shut the truth up. It's an integrated spirit. It's the one world government. It's the one world currency. It's the one world council of churches. I get the calls all the time, or I used to get the calls all the time. Will you come to the pastor's fellowship? 
Could you guys see me? How many of you guys know me? You guys know me? Could you guys see me in a pastor's fellowship with all the other pastors from all the area of whatever denomination? Hi, how are you? Hello, how are you? Like, ugh, you give me the creeps, man. How, how, is that, how is that honestly going to work? I'm going to sit down with the Catholic priest. What do we have to talk about? So how's your wife and kids? You know what I mean? Like, this is like not going to work. You understand what I'm saying? You ain't never seen a gym in your life, man. I don't know what to talk to you about. You have never, you've obviously never been punched in the face. Look at that pretty little perfect nose. You know what I mean? Like, what are we about to talk about? But it's all get together. Oh, you need to come to the pastor's fellowship. So oh, that guy over there in 10 Mile, he just doesn't love anybody. He just thinks he's all in. He just doesn't. We've been trying to get a hold of you and you won't come. No, you're right. Stop trying to get a hold of me. I'm sick of deleting these messages. My thumb hurts. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a bad spirit that says we all got to get together. If I go sit down at a table to break bread with some of those guys that don't believe the Bible at all and don't believe in salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm condoning them. Uh, when you see God start to work, what does God do in Genesis chapter 1? First thing He does on the scene, He starts dividing. He divides the water from the water. Ain't that weird? He tells you to be careful about your fellowship, careful about your friends. God does divide. But this modern day foolishness is a lie and a trick of the devil. This thing is an integrated deal. Listen to me. When you come in these doors, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how tall you are, how short you are, how fat you are, how skinny you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care how much money you got in the bank, how much money you don't got in the bank. None of that matters. I don't care if you drove a beater here or if you pulled in in a Rolls or a Bentley. It means nothing to me. And you go, well, you need the money. I understand about needing money. I understand how having to hit a budget. I get on my knees and pray about it daily. I pray that God will supply the needs of this ministry daily. I hope you pray with me. I, don't, I just said I don't care about your money. All I care about when you walk through the doors of those church, the, the, walk through the doors of this church, is do you believe this book? And if you don't, why not? And are you interested in finding out about it? And do you want the truth? Whatever the truth is, do you want the truth? If you want the truth and you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you're looking for the truth and you're coming in here for that reason, that is the only requirement to be in here. It's truth. That's the one thing that we're unified on. It's called the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Outside of that, I'm not worried about being unified with everybody. I sure want to reach them all. I sure want to be kind to them. I sure want to have a good spirit about me. I sure want to be careful about my testimony. But I'm not worried about being buddies with everybody. That's beside the point. That's a demonic spirit. Now look at verse 3. I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death. So here's this guy that has a seat in verse 2. And, and the dragon gives him power and great authority. You see that? Ain't that weird? The dragon that don't want authority. The dragon don't want authority. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That same guy wants you to obey him every time. That's a bad spirit. You see kids that don't want to be told what to do, you know what they're doing? They're telling their mom and dad what to do. Everybody believes in authority. The issue is, who's the authority? You see, that's the problem. You got guys all the time, and I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this because one came recently, and, and he's not here. and didn't come back and probably won't. And I wish to God he'd see the light and come and be a happy part of the church. But not as long as he's got an agenda. But they've come in here every so often and they come in and they say, I don't believe in local church. Now hang on a minute. Not the smartest guy you've ever seen in your life. But I'm not, I don't think I'm that stupid either. You just said you don't believe in local church. Why did you come to a local church? Anybody else with me? Got a couple rocks in there clanging together like, ugh. <laughs> You're not a very sharp individual when you walk in here and say, I don't believe in local church, and then you come in here. But, but you know what those, listen, this, I'm telling you I'm, giving you, I'm giving you the red flag so you spot them when you hear them. They always believe in house church. Guess where? At their house. Oh, I don't believe in having a pastor, a pastoral authority in a church. Come to my house, let me teach you. Okay. 
And where are the bodies buried? <laughs> Did you invite me because these look like good chips, you know, once you fry them. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that's weird, man. That's weirding me out a little bit. They come in with an authority problem because they want you to submit to their authority. I had about half a dozen guys or more say, Preacher, this guy came when you were gone. And it was a little weird because he said he don't believe in local church. We've just seen too many. I said, okay, we'll keep an eye on him. Don't worry about it. Thanks for letting me know. Why? We've seen too many of that happen. It's an authority problem. There's too much accountability with this. People sit there and view the preacher as being the, you know, the authority. Like, he doesn't answer to anybody. Are you crazy? You know, I answer to everybody here. And everybody that knows I'm a pastor. And I'm going to answer to God. You think that being the pastor means that you're the ultimate authority? That's not how it is. That's, it's, it's a bad view of the whole thing. Something in us just has this rebellious spirit and this anti-authority thing. And it's funny that Lucifer gives him authority when Lucifer has the ultimate authority problem. That's why they always tell you, watch out when they turn 13. By the way, don't get in your kid's head like that. It's just a number. You turn 13, it's the number of rebellion. You're going to be rebellious. Not necessarily. But it is when a lot of times that stuff begins to start. And you're in chapter 13, the number of rebellion. And chapter 13 is telling you about the Antichrist. In Genesis 13, 13, the men of Sodom are sinners exceedingly and wicked before the Lord. Isn't that weird? You got an authority problem. So he gives authority to this beast. And then in verse 3, one of the heads of the beast is wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. All right, let's look at some references real quick. Go to Psalms chapter 74. I've showed you this one before, but I'm going to show it to you again. Psalm chapter 74. And, I, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to get to it tonight, this, uh, this, this evening. I should have time to get to it, but I'm going to show you why this is so important. Because this spirit's already in the world. Psalm 74, look at verse 13. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads, you see it, of the dragons in the water. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces... And gave us him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. What a crazy passage. I showed you that how in the tribulation period, God's going to have Israel run for safety. And he's going to hide them out there in Selah Petra in a very defensible position up high in the rocks where they can be defended very easily. And they're going to be hiding out there and they're going to see miracles from God of manna coming down like they did when they were in the wilderness. God's going to feed them with manna from heaven. But this verse tells you that that manna somehow or another, you say, explain every detail of that to me, preacher. I can't. But somehow or another, this manna, they're going to actually be feeding on one of the heads of Lucifer. You know what's a funny thing? You got, uh, you got uh, uh, the Disney movie uh, Sleeping Beauty. The dragon's cut in the throat by a sword and bleeds hoarfrost. One of Dr. Ruckman's notes right here. Isn't that weird? You ever see that stuff? Where do they get that stuff from? They get that from the Bible. There's some kind of inspiration going on in the entertainment that our kids sit and watch. There's an inspiration behind that stuff. Those people aren't Bible-believing Christians. Disney making this stuff. And getting your kids used to a dragon being slain by a sword. And nobody can kill this fearsome dragon. And it's got tight scales. And it breathes fire. All the stuff I showed you about Leviathan and about Lucifer and about that dragon. Ain't that wild stuff? Where are those people coming up with this stuff? You know what they're doing? They're preparing you for something. Well, not you. Hopefully not you. We're not ignorant of his devices. But they're preparing this world for something. Where are you coming up with all these stories, these movies about aliens coming down from outer space and the alien women shape-shifting, the alien, in, the alien beasts shape-shifting into women and then reproducing? Well, that stuff's in the Bible. Why would God drown out the whole world? <laughs> Why would God kill innocent animals? Because they weren't so innocent. Where's Greek mythology come from? Genetic mutations. Folks, there's a lot more going on in the world around you than what meets the eye. And these things come down from outer space and shape shift into what looks like human beings. And I've taught you that stuff before. I've shown you that stuff's in the Bible. And the stuff's going to happen again in the future. And I got a feeling it's already starting. That's wild stuff, isn't it? 
God Almighty smacks that thing in the head and, and wounds this beast. Uh, look at some other verses. Go to Zechariah chapter 11 and let me show you something real interesting. I'll show you something about the perfection and power of your King James Bible. This is the Bible that God preserved. When somebody says the Word of God, if I ever start saying open the Word of God, right? I like the way that sounds. Hey, instead of open up your Bibles, I like saying, would you open the Word of God with me? Listen, that's a great sound. Guess what I mean when I say open the Word of God with me? I mean a King James Bible. Now, if you don't understand that issue or you got a different Bible, please breathe deep in your nose, out your mouth, relax. Everything's fine. We don't do a Bible check. I'm not checking the bindings of the Bibles as you come in. Let me see. Is that a King James? Okay, you can pass. What do you got? Up, get out. You know, okay, you can pass. It's not like that. I've had people come to my church for a long time carrying other versions. That's okay. Keep coming to church. Did you hear me? Oh, Reagan's a compromiser. No, you're, you're, you're being a little bit critical. You're a little harsh. You keep opening your Bible and you follow along while we preach. And before long, you're going to be like, my Bible doesn't say that. Where do you get that from? And he's right. Wow, look at that. And before long, you'll be a Bible believer. Okay? And in the meanwhile, you're still my friend. So just wait and be patient and grow in the Lord. Look at Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. Let me show you one of the reasons I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. Besides a million other things, like he promised he'd preserve it from this generation forever. And he promised he'd preserve every word. And God doesn't lie. That's another one. So if he preserved every word and he doesn't lie, he preserved every word. And if you've got a Bible that doesn't have the same words as my Bible, one of them's wrong. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. Watch it. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean, dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. You got to see the idle shepherd? How is idle spelled in a King James Bible? I D O L. Not I D L E. You know what he's telling you? He's telling you something about this shepherd. This shepherd is an idle shepherd, he's a religious leader. I mean, the shepherds are instructed in, in, uh, in 2 Peter, and that when the chief, or 1 Peter 5, and then the, when the chief shepherd shall appear. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. Pastors are under shepherds. Bible preachers and Bible teachers are under shepherds. We're not the shepherd. But we do have to take care of, uh, feed the what of God? The flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Isn't that what a shepherd does? Isn't that the instructions all the way through the Bible? This guy in Zechariah 11:17 is some kind of a religious leader that God calls the idle shepherd and God puts a I D O L. Of course it takes a idiotic scholar to come in and fix God for him, you know, he's just too impotent to be able to preserve a word. The God that spoke the universe into existence is too impotent just just lacking power to produce a book and keep it in your life. He put breath in your lungs. You know what a miracle your body is? It's an amazing thing. And that God can't preserve a book? It's I-D-O-L for a reason. And only an educated idiot would change that, thinking that he's God. This shepherd is wounded. He's a shepherd that leaves the flock and a sword's on his right arm and upon his right eye and his right arm's clean dried up. So his right arm's all shriveled up and crippled. You know what's a funny thing? You watch world leaders, I think it was Hitler would stand and hold his arm because he had a messed up arm. Or Napoleon. Napoleon had something too, huh? What? Go ahead, say it louder. Say it louder. Okay, thank you. Whoever that is. That's the history major over there. Hitler had issues, Napoleon had issues, that guy had issues. <laughs> These guys are world conquerors. He's, pro he's right, I'm not mocking him, he's just, he's right, he's Mr. History over there. These guys are world conquerors. It's a spirit that already worketh in the world. Ain't that weird? Just saying, it's just, it's just food for thought, it's weird. You look back throughout history, <clears throat> you can see how all the way down the line throughout history, the devil had a man in place, and God's had a man in place, where God can do whatever God wants to do whenever God wants to do it. That's what I believe. There's a weird spirit about them. They're world leaders. I showed you last week the beast can be a man, right? It is a man. 
I showed you it can be a kingdom, and it's a kingdom in the end times. The three different applications to the beast. Remember running those references? Oh, ain't that weird? All right, so you got an idle shepherd here who gets wounded, and his, eye, his right eye is utterly darkened. Uh, look at uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse 48. I'm showing you the way the devil works. So you got the dragon in chapter 12, and then this beast pops up in chapter 13, who's affiliated with the dragon and given power by the dragon to do something in the world. It's the Antichrist. Luke 22, 48. I got to hurry up, man. I've been preaching too long lately. Jesus said unto, unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man how? With a kiss. All right, so Judas is the spirit of what? He's got the spirit of the Antichrist. Do you remember what Jesus Christ passed him in a King James Bible? A sop. The new Bibles do, since none of you, none of you modern day Americans know what a sop is. The new Bibles change that sop for you. They make sure that you can understand that it's a morsel dipped in wine or some stupid thing that they say. You know what a sop actually means if you go back and look at it in a, in a, in a, in a Webster's 1828 English dictionary? It's a morsel dipped in wine. You ever sop anything up? Sure you do. Oh, the Bible's not as archaic as I thought, huh? You know why he used the word sop when he handed it to Judas? You know what sop stands for? Son of perdition. You know what the Bible tells you Judas did when he went out and hanged himself? Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He went out and hung himself, right? Yeah. You know what it tells you that he did? It says he went unto his own place. Yeah. You know what happens in the tribulation period? He comes up out of the bottomless pit. Yeah. You know what that is? That's the spirit of Judas. You know what Jesus said to him? One of you is a devil. Preacher's crazy to think that there's aliens already walking around appearing as man. Okay, well, whatever. You think what you believe what you want. I'm studying the Bible, and I'm telling you, there's some wild stuff going on in that book, and there's some wild stuff going on in the world now, and it's going to get wilder in the tribulation period. So you just keep watching the news, and you keep reading your Bible, and you're going to realize, man, God was way out ahead of these people. All right, look at another passage. Go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So Judas kisses Jesus Christ. Ain't that wild to kiss the door to heaven and land in hell shortly thereafter? Ain't that something else, man? You know how many people go into these churches and sit there and hear all about Jesus? They kiss the door to heaven, boy. I mean, you're that close sitting at supper with him. And that old slew foot comes in there and starts weaving his way up and down those pews and weaving his way through that pulpit and wrapping himself up in the words of that man who speaks with flatteries like the Antichrist himself. Flattering preachers. Smooth talking. Yea, hath God said preachers. And the people are, oh, wow, that's so good. And they're that close. They're that close. They're kissing the door of heaven and landing in hell. Because he's more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to what? Excuse me? And not to God. I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot what? Drink the cup. Drink the cup. What church do you know they drink out of a cup? I'm going to show you more if this is stretching your mind. Stay with us as we go through Revelation. You'll see a woman drunken with blood. What do they tell you that turns to? Blood. They say when they bless that, it's the blood of Christ. It's called transubstantiation. It's transubstantiation. It's crossing over. It's shape-shifting in front of you guys. Don't you get it? I mean, like, doesn't that break your heart for people that are deceived by that stuff? I'm not saying all those stupid Catholics. I'm saying ain't that heartbreaking how obvious it is and they don't see it because nobody's giving them the Bible. Well, the, the church teaches and our Holy Father said and the church believes and the church believes and truth doesn't change. Why is the church changing its position on a lot of things? Because it's getting more and more integrated. 
oh, we're all trying to get to the same place. Do you know what the, actual, the church actually teaches? Every last one of you is going to burn in hell. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. How's that? Because they, the actual doctrine of the church, the real doctrine, because there's no salvation outside of the Holy Mother Church. That's what they believe. So if you're not a part of the Holy Mother Church, you're going to hell. Now, they won't tell you Americans that because they're afraid of losing your tithe money and your membership. You need to pack up and travel with me to Haiti and see the real leopard, the real cat, the real cataholic. You watch them people go through a whole week-long voodoo ritual of unbelievable debauchery. Listen, I said debauchery. I've been there multiple times. The vileness of their sin as they're, as they're worshiping the devil through their voodoo witchcraft. You walk up and down the streets before you criticize or think I'm making stuff up. If you got the guts to go, you probably shouldn't right now. And you see what goes on, and at the end of their week-long uh, voodoo rituals, they go into the Roman Catholic Church on Sunday, and the priest blesses them. That's the culmination of their demonic ritual. Go to Mexico, ask Miss Lisi. Go to Mexico and see the reality of the Roman Catholic Church as opposed to what you deal with. Go like we did right before Christmas when they're making their journeys and they're walking for miles and miles and miles and they're crawling on the roads to bloody in their knees trying to find their penance and carrying their burdens as they travel and the whole time they're having a drunken brawl with it. <laughs> yeah, and then you say, well, he's so hard on Catholics. Hey, you know, Americanized version because they're a stinking shape-shifting mess. They're not telling you the truth. They're not giving you reality. They're not telling you what they actually believe. I've never been there, but I've read about it. The, the, the Filipino Catholics that nail themselves to a cross. Yeah, he's, we Americans, we got a little, I mean, we just, we, we're pretty off, man. American Christians and American people, I, I, I love you. This is where I'm supposed to be, and, I, and I, I'm not being a jerk, but I'm just telling you, I get sick of it, man. This is a big world you're on. And then we want to force that, that great big God in heaven and the expansive, un, 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 unsearchable riches of his book into our little image of what we think it ought to be. I'm telling you right now, when you bow down to an idol and pray to it, it's not an aid to worship. You're literally praying to a devil and they don't necessarily know it. Because the devil wants what? What did he say to Jesus? Bow down and what? Worship me. He wants worship. So them spirits jump in that idol while they're sitting there praying to it, and they're getting what they want out of it. He said, you're not sacrificing to God, and they claim they're doing it to God. It's an aid to worship. No, it ain't. It's demonic. Oh, it's just a statue. It just helps me pray. I'm praying my beads. And the Bible tells you not to pray with vain repetition as the... Well, I mean, somebody's not reading their Bible. Somebody's not getting in the pulpit and giving you the Bible. That spirit is anti-Christ. Because it's saying, well, Jesus plus the church. Jesus plus your prayers. Jesus plus your worship. If it's not Christ, it's not Christ at all. If it's not all of Christ, it's not Christ at all. So it's a demonic thing that's going on. Now, look at the rest of the verse. He says, you, you, serve the, uh, you drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You can't partake of both at once. Now, listen to me. Hear me clearly, please. There's a lot of saved people. I, I, a lot may be stretching it. But there's saved people that go to the Catholic Church. Did you know that? My grandparents got saved and they had a hard time coming out of the Catholic Church. To, to, to tell you even more, it was actually really funny. They had a statue of Mary and, and she was in the garden out in front. And they got saved, and my dad's like, that's an idol, you know? Ah, it's okay, it's Mother Mary, it's Mother Mary. <laughs> they, they couldn't. So then they moved her in the house. And my dad's like, so, you know, they were always making excuses for Mother Mary. So then, as time went on, we went back to the house, and they turned her, and she was facing the corner. We're like, is Mother Mary in trouble, or what's the deal here? 
And then before long, Mother Mary wound up in the basement. They just couldn't get themselves to separate from Mother Mary because they were so brainwashed by Mother Mary, by the Catholic Church. They were born again, good people, growing very slowly. And before long, they were able to break that attachment. There's saved people in the Catholic Church. There's saved people in the Catholic Church that if, if they're really saved, I can fellowship with them about that much. It's never wrong to go as far down the right road with somebody as you can. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. It's never wrong to go as far down the right road with somebody as you can. But it's never right to put one foot on the wrong road. All right, go to another passage. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. Just a couple more for tonight, and then we'll take a break till next week. But look at 1 Kings chapter 19. Look at verse 18, which incidentally is 6 plus 6 plus 6. He says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not what? So when you bow to Baal and worship a false god, you're worshiping an idol. And what did they do when they worshiped an idol? They kissed it. What did the spirit of Antichrist do with Jesus? He kissed him. What are you worshiping when you're worshiping an idol? You're worshiping a devil. You know one of the most holy relics the Roman Catholic Church has is the Pope's ring? One of the most holy religious symbols they've got. And what does he have you do? You guys, somebody is not reading their Bible. One of the things that tipped my grandpa off, my dad would bring his Bible over and try to witness to him, my, my Italian grandpa, my mom's dad. My dad would bring his Bible over and try to witness to him. And grandpa got to a point where he, I remember it, I can remember it, he was screaming at him. And grandpa was my height, but he was a professional boxer, a real stocky, real strong guy. And, uh, and dad was tall and skinny. And dad was a, to, had trained a little bit of karate and he had those long legs, you know, and Grandpa was a short boxer. And I remember looking, thinking like, man, this would be a great fight. Dad could kick him in the face, but Grandpa could knock him out. And I was like, waiting to see what would happen. I didn't really want it to happen. It was really kind of like a turmoil in me, but I thought it would be cool if they did because Grandpa was like, ah, ah, ah. and he said, don't you ever bring that Bible into my house again. And he's getting ready to leave the church. And, and without telling Dad, Dad had been getting in his head and he started carrying his Bible into church. And as he was leaving the church, the Catholic priest said, John, leave that book at home. You don't need it. When you come here, I'll tell you what it says. My grandpa said, what do you mean leave my Bible at home? He said, leave it at home, John. When you come here, I'll tell you what it says. And he's like, he's enough of a rebel where he's like, how come you're telling me to leave my Bible at home? No. Well, because if you get a Bible and somebody starts teaching you the Bible, you're going to see through that stuff. That thing ain't connected nothing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is all wrong. Every bit of that's wrong. I am telling you what you're looking at in, Revel in Revelation chapter 13 is the Antichrist, and he's a man connected to a kingdom, and it's a kingdom that's going to be in existence in the end times. And he gets power from the dragon, and it's power to unify, and it's associated with a kiss. That's weird stuff. It's associated with idolatry. Oh, let me see. I got to figure out where to cut it off here tonight. I got so much more for you, it's not even funny. Go back over to Revelation. No, go to Numbers 22. Let me show you this one. I'm going to show you this one and maybe, uh, maybe one or two more, and we'll stop for tonight. Look at Numbers 22. Numbers chapter 22, look at verse 41. Now watch this. What I'm going to show you is an unholy trinity. Numbers 22, 41. And it came pass on the morrow that Balak, you see it? He's a king. Took Balaam, he's a prophet, into the high places of Baal, he's a false god, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. You know what you got? You've got a king 
that represents the Antichrist, Balak. Balak was against the people of God. And he gets a prophet that he wants to work through, which represents an unholy spirit. It's a spirit not giving you the truth. And he's connected to an unholy God, a false God, Baal. And those three are working like one. You got right there, tucked into the Old Testament, a little bit of a sign for you of how the devil's going to work, how he's going to use religion, he's going to get him to worship a false god, he's going to do it through a false king, and it's an unholy trinity. Look at Revelation chapter 16. We're jumping a little bit ahead of ourselves, but we're going to stop. Uh, we'll go back to Revelation chapter 13, and we'll stop there for tonight. But uh, almost done here, just a couple more minutes. Look at Revelation chapter 16. And let me just show you this verse. And of course, it's going to be coincidentally verse number either 18 or 13. I heard an 18, and that's a good guess. But look at number 13 this time. I saw three unclean spirits. Like frogs. Remember what God hit Egypt with? Isn't that weird? Unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. You know what that thing is? That's an unholy trinity. That is the dragon representing the father, the, the beast representing the son, and an unclean spirit that he's preaching. Those three are what? He's trying to copycat God. The Antichrist is getting his power from the dragon. It's Lucifer behind him, promoting him and putting him in the position and giving him the power and giving him a what? He gives him a, a seat. That's Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Ah, there it goes again. Revelation 2, what? 13, that where Satan's seat is. Well, wait a minute. Anybody know a religious leader who's a king? Did you guys know that? How many of you knew the Pope's a king? How many of you knew that Vatican City in Italy is its own country? And he's got his own army. And he's a political power, a mover and shaker on the world stage. I got more for you. Wait till we get the number of the beast. You're going to be blown away. If you don't see it already, you're going to see it as clear as day. And the only way you're not going to see it is because you just flat stubbornly don't want to believe it. He's a king. He's a religious leader. And he's got a seat that he sits on. And when he sits on that throne... And declares things. He can speak ex cathedra, which is as the voice of God on the earth. You ever seen anything more satanic in your whole life? We don't have time to go over there to Th Th Second Thessalonians like I was going to show you. And how they wonder at him. And how he comes with signs, tongues, and lying wonders. He's showing all the signs that you get in the New Testament that God gave to the apostles to show Israel that they crucified their Messiah, which signs faded away with time, as the Bible teaches you, because you're Gentiles, not Jews. And in the tribulation period, God starts using signs again to show the Jews with Moses and Elijah and then being killed and raised again after three days and standing up and preaching and, and all the signs that God starts using with the angels flying in heaven preaching the everlasting gospel, smiting the head of Leviathan and feeding them with hoarfrost. God starts giving Israel signs again. And Lucifer steps in and says, okay, I'm going to show you that I'm Christ. And he starts speaking in tongues, and he takes this guy that gets slain, this, this beast that gets killed, and he raises that thing from the dead. And says, there it is, he's Jesus, he rose from the dead, and he can heal people, and he can speak in tongues, and look at this, this is him. Back to Revelation chapter 13. I'm telling you, it's important to get your doctrine right. Revelation chapter 13, what happens? I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and the world did what? Why? They're wondering after him because they're like, my goodness, man, this thing came up from the dead. So he gets killed. Somebody tries to assassinate him, and he gets wounded and gets raised again. 
at verse 4, And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So he starts speaking blasphemies. And I'm going to come and show you next week. I'm going to show you next week. I'm going to stop now because if I even try to show you this next one, I'll be another ten minutes. I'm really trying to let you guys go better. You, you just listen so good. I lose track of time sometimes. I'm sorry. But listen, I'm going to show you next week to speak blasphemies is to call somebody a holy father that ain't God. Now I'll show you the references on it. He goes in and he sits down in that temple of God showing himself that he is God. He moves that seat from Rome. He moves into Jerusalem and he sits down in the temple of God and he says, I am God. Come sacrifice these fools that won't take my mark and won't take my name on this altar and worship me. And I'm God. And he shows him his power. And he speaks blasphemy against God. And they say, yes, Holy Father. And they bow to him and worship. And they kiss his ring. You haven't seen anything so eerie and demonic in all your life when you see a picture of a man standing there in these holy garments holding the ring out and somebody's bowing to him and they don't realize what they're doing. They're so blinded by the devil, the God of this world, blinded the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel, which is the image of Christ, should shine unto them. And they're bowing and they're kissing that ring. Intelligent people, educated people, smart people, that'll pray to an idol and have no idea what they're doing. Folks, there's an unholy spirit working in all that stuff and working in religion. That's why we're Bible believers. That's why we leave the lights on and we say, bring your Bible. That's why I tell you when I get up and open up the Bible and start talking on behalf of God and on the Word of God, do you understand that's what I'm doing? I'm up here speaking on behalf of God and on behalf of the Word of God. And the only way I know I'm speaking on behalf of God is because He called me to do it, put it in me, and requires it of me. And number two, I know I'm right when I'm in that book. That's why I soak in that Bible all week long. I get my references together. I figure out how to lay them down. I do a rough draft. I do a second rough draft sometimes. I do a third sometimes. I soak in that thing and try to memorize that thing. So if I forget my notes, I get up and try to preach my message without my notes if I had to. But I'm trying to soak in that book to give you that book and answer your questions and be willingly answering your questions and willingly approached to ask me about what we believe and why and say, well, let me show you and turn to this verse and turn to that verse. Why? Because I'm supposed to be speaking for God. And the only way you know I'm actually speaking for God is if you're seeing it in that book in front of you. And when a man gets up and says, well, that's an unfortunate rendering, and that verse shouldn't be there, and this other translation makes it make more sense, and in the originals what that means, and well, what the church believes, and what the church teaches, and when that guy's doing that kind of stuff, well, historically the, our doctrine is this, and well, just leave your Bible at home, I'll tell you what it means. You better say, wait a second, there's something wrong with that. Sanctify them through thy truth. It's your Savior praying it. Thy word is truth. He gave you the word in Ephesians 5 to wash you with water by the word that he can present himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Not having spot. Not having spot. I'm going to show you the spot, the mark, and the name. Everybody's obsessed with the mark. There's more than one. There's a spot, a mark, and a name. Ash Wednesday. It's heartbreaking, ain't it? Go witness to a Catholic this week. Pray for one. Try to lead somebody to Christ. Stay in your Bible. Love your Bible. Believe your Bible. It's your safety. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you tonight. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you so much.